Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Berman. I'm on the board of the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, and uh, it is my pleasure right now, whoops, need the glasses, to, um, to welcome you to one of the most exciting sessions that we have during the conference. These are the industry updates. And I also want to give a special welcome to uh, all of those conference attendees who are attending virtually from around the world. As mentioned earlier today, it is a very, very exciting time for drug development in DM, with more and more companies focused on the disease. Today, we will hear from five senior leaders uh, of companies that are actively developing drugs uh, for myotonic dystrophy. You'll see them listed in the program on page 16. And today, we're going to learn about the progress that's being made by Harmony Biosciences, Avidity Biosciences, Dyne Therapeutics, Grit Gene Therapeutics, and AMO Pharma. In the interest of time, we'll invite the first speaker to the podium and then have subsequent speakers immediately follow and introduce themselves. Please hold your questions until the end of the entire session and consider writing them down. We have a packed agenda and we may not have enough time for all of the questions to be asked. So please note that many of these companies will have booths uh, outside at the exhibitor tables. And in addition, you'll be able to ask questions during the Saturday evening research poster uh, and exhibitor reception. The session is being recorded and will be available on the MDF Digital Academy within the next month. And that's at www.myotonic.org digital academy. And right now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Jacobson to the podium. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll start off by apologizing that I'm your dessert this afternoon. Um, actually, uh, before we get going, I just wanted to thank the foundation for the opportunity, for the pleasure and the privilege to talk with you a little bit about Harmony Biosciences and what we're doing in the area of clinical development or type one myotonic dystrophy. Let's see if I can figure this out. So a little bit about Harmony and who we are. We're a pharmaceutical company. We're located in Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. We do have most of our clinical group actually located in the Chicago area though. Um, we are focused on developing novel therapies to address uh, unmet need in rare diseases of the central nervous system. Um, uh, we've been around for about five years. Uh, we are a member of the Paragon family of pharmaceutical families. Uh, the drug that I'm going to talk with you about today, which is Betolacent, um, was licensed to us by our partner in France, Bioproje. Um, and uh, we have been public for a couple of years. We're a fully integrated company and we're growing rapidly because there is so much to do in this area. We have approximately 200 uh, employees. So a uh, uh, quick primer, I'm sure this is not news to uh, most of you, a little bit about DM1 specifically. Uh, as you may know, uh, while the term myotonic refers to musculature, myotonic dystrophy is in fact a multi-systemic disorder and it impacts many, many systems. It certainly impacts the heart, the gut, the brain, the eyes, <clears throat> the endocrine system, and, and many, many others. We at Harmony are focused on the non-muscular and non-neuromuscular symptoms of the disorder. Uh, in particular, we're focused on excessive daytime sleepiness, but we're also investigating fatigue, which is somewhat different from sleepiness, and cognitive dysfunction, overall burden of disease. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as I mentioned, we're focusing to a large extent on sleep. We all sleep every night, some of us a little bit better than others. Sleep is uh, natural periodically recurring of a uh, state of inactivity, um, characterized uh, by loss of consciousness, inability to respond to stimuli and so on. Wakefulness is actually closely related, but is somewhat different is the absence of sleep and is marked by consciousness and, and awareness and activity. Now, interestingly within the brain and myotonic dystrophy is at least in part a disorder of the brain, sleep and wakefulness are controlled by two different but interrelated systems. We are focused on a chemical, a neurochemical or neurotransmitter in the brain called histamine. And many of you may be familiar with this from your use of antihistamines to treat allergies, hay fever, 
hives, things of this, this um, nature. Histamine is actually a very important neurochemical within the brain, and it's very, very much involved in those systems in the brain that control sleep and wakefulness. So the investig investigational medication that we are studying, pitolisant, uh, has been shown to increase histamine levels in the brain. It gets into the brain, it increases the amount of histamine. And in addition to that, it also influences a number of other chemicals that are involved in the control of sleep and wakefulness. So um, as I've mentioned, uh, type one myotonic dystrophy is a multi-systemic disorder. There are many, many symptoms that patients complain of. This just lists the prevalence of some of the, the, the symptoms. Um, in addition to demonstrating the prevalence though, I would like you to notice the fact that it's the impact of some of these symptoms that is really important and can be very problematic. So while certainly, um, activity, muscular issues are very, very problematic in the disorder. Things such as sleep, fatigue, um, uh, brain fog, cognitive dysfunction also have very, very high levels of impact. Um, and it's very, very important that we consider addressing them as we move forward. So we do have an ongoing phase two clinical trial in adults with type one myotonic dystrophy. In any trial that is ongoing, one has to have an objective. What is it that we're trying to do? Well, in this case, our objective is to evaluate the safety, and that comes first, as well as the efficacy of pitolisan compared to an inactive drug to a placebo in treating excessive daytime sleepiness in adult patients with type 1 myotonic dystrophy. Once you have an objective, you have to have a means of achieving or demonstrating that you've achieved that objective. And in this case, we have a primary endpoint, and that is the change in the average daytime sleepiness scale, or the DSS, which is a scale that has been developed specifically in patients with type 1 myotonic dystrophy, looking at the beginning of the study to the end of the study in where we're going to be comparing our drug, our active drug, pitolosant, to an inactive drug, to a placebo. And if we can get this to go, I'll be happy to talk with you about our secondary objectives. Can you guys advance the slide up there? There we go. Okay, so in addition to the main or primary objective, we do have a number of secondary objectives, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. As I've mentioned, we're looking at fatigue. We're looking at various elements of cognition, which is often referred to in one way or another informally as brain fog. We're looking at psychomotor function or how quickly the brain works, speed of processing. We're looking at attention. We're looking at working memory. We're also looking at two very, very important aspects. One is the clinician's perspective of whether these symptoms and particularly sleepiness are improved with the drug. And the other is whether the patient perceives a benefit. The FDA has made it clear that they're not really interested solely in the demonstration of an impact on a scale of some sort, but they really want to understand whether patients perceive benefit to taking the drug in question. <clears throat> in addition, we're going to be looking at the overall burden of disease using an instrument called the MD-HIGH, which was developed at uh, the University of Rochester and examines a large number of symptoms of myotonic dystrophy. So who can get into the study? What do you need to do? And I'm going to go through these fairly quickly in the interest of time. We're looking at adults with proven through genetic testing um, presence of type 1 myotonic dystrophy. We're looking for patients who have moderate or severe excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, we, in, in order to minimize the impact of certain external drugs, we're asking that patients either abstain from or wash out of um, cannabis products. Um, we are allowing patients who are on wake-promoting agents, such as new vigil or provigil, modafinil, armodafinil, a number of the drugs used to treat ADHD, the amphetamines, and so on, to enter the study with the proviso that they have to have residual excessive daytime sleepiness. So if you're on a wake-promoting agent that does not exclude you, we just ask you to maintain your dosage and be on a stable dosage. <clears throat> We're asking for patients who are able to walk independently with or without an assistive device. So braces, canes, walkers, and so on are permitted. Uh, as is the case with most uh, investigational drugs, we're asking women of childbearing potential to take appropriate contraceptive uh, measures. And finally, in the opinion of the investigator, we're asking that the patient is capable of understanding the protocol and following the requirements of the protocol. 
Those are some of the inclusion criteria. There are also a number of exclusion criteria which might prevent someone from entering the study. So there are a number of things that can contribute to excessive daytime sleepiness. One of them is simply sleep deprivation. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're gonna be sleepy during the day. So we ask our patients to undertake a sleep diary um, so that we can assure they're getting sufficient sleep prior to entry into the study. Another thing that can cause daytime sleepiness is our, our sleep-related breathing disorders, such as obstructive sleep apnea. And again, we're not excluding patients with these disorders, but we want to ensure that a disorder such as obstructive sleep apnea is not the primary contributor to the excessive daytime sleepiness that we see. We don't want patients who have been in another study of an investigational drug within a month of this one. Um, use of any medications that would interfere with the actions of patolosant are excluded, and we do allow for washout of certain of these drugs. Um, we do allow patients to take sleep promoting agents, sleeping pills basically, no more than twice a week, and certainly not on the evening before a clinic visit. This tends not to be a problem because our patients typically do not suffer from insomnia, they suffer from excessive sleepiness. Um, and finally, based on the opinion of the investigator, the patient for any reason at all is unsuitable following the, the requirements of the study. Um, I do wanna say very quickly something about the heart. Um, the heart is very, very frequently impacted to a certain extent in uh, type one myotonic dystrophy. There are all kinds of things that can happen. The most common thing that we see are so-called conduction defects. These can be treated in various ways, including the use of implanted devices. We've spoken to patients in the past who have told us that they have not been allowed to enter a study because they've had an implanted device. That is not the case here. We're allowing certain implanted devices that are there to treat coexisting heart disease um, to, as in a prophylactic manner, in other words, to prevent certain disorders. But we're also excluding patients with certain very significant cardiac disease, since this is an investigational drug and safety is very, very primary for us. So before you actually get into the study, we monitor you with a Holter device, which is basically uh, an electrocardiogram that you wear for 24 hours. And then we monitor you throughout the study at various times with electrocardiograms and with additional Holters. So what's required? Participation in the study takes approximately four months from the very, very beginning until the very, very end. You're gonna be asked to do the sleep um, uh, diary. As I told you, you may be asked to do a sleep study, although it is no longer required to enter into the study. You'll have blood tests. We're gonna determine that you have the genetic signature. Um, you'll keep the sleep diary, as I mentioned. You'll be asked to do a number of questionnaires relating to your sleep, your symptoms, how you're feeling physical exams, a little bit of blood, some cardiograms, and we'll ask you to take the medication once a day in the morning when you wake up. We have 22 trial sites. The vast majority are in the United States. We have three sites in Canada. Some of our investigators are present here. Um, the sites are listed. Um, if anyone is interested in participating but lives remotely from one of our sites, we will provide assistance. We'll cover your transportation, accommodation, meals, so on and so forth. So there are really no impediments to participating simply because you don't live proximate to one of our sites. After the double blind part of the study is complete, we enter or we give you the option of entering into an open label long term extension study during which you will have access to the drug itself. We will be able to collect additional uh, long-term safety information. If you meet the criteria for that part of the trial and you choose to continue, as I mentioned, you'll receive open label investigation um, and we'll have periodic check-ins typically by phone um, just to ensure that things are going well, make sure you're, you're still taking the medication appropriately and question you about symptoms and safety. We do have a booth that's located directly outside of this room on the right side. Um, I would encourage you to stop by and visit if you have any questions or any interest. My colleagues are here. They'd be happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. Um, and with that, I will thank you for your attention and I will pass it on to the next um, participant. And again, happy to answer your questions outside after this session. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, how are you feeling? <laughs> Hope you had a good lunch. All right, um, so I am Lee Tai. I am an executive director at Avidity Biosciences, um, and uh, I work in clinical development. Um, first, I want to thank the MDF conference um, organizers for um, the chance to speak here today. We're very excited to share a little bit of information about our company, our science, and also um, the work we're doing for the 
um, DN1 um, mild time dystrophy type 1. So this is just to say that I will be making some forward-looking statement in our presentation today. So Avidity Biosciences is located in La Jolla, California, which is about 13 miles north of here. Um, our mission is to develop innovative therapy to improve the lives of people impacted by rare and serious disease, and this include myotonic dystrophy. To do this, we have two strategies. One, we assemble a uh, group of people who, are, ha who have very extensive experience in drug development. And um, second, we are committed to involve patients and family every step of the way in our clinical trial um, process. To go into our philosophy a little bit more um, deeply, we are committed and understand that drug development process is really a partnership between the DN1 community and us so that we can better understand the needs of families and uh, patients with DN1 and so that we can develop a meaningful therapy for them. Uh, we plan to partner early and collaborate often with patients and advocacy leaders and because of that, our clinical trial programs are designed um, to support um, the family, so to ensure that we're meeting their needs and expectations, and to generate meaningful data that would best reflect the changes in um, people's uh, quality of life. So let me move on to the science and tell you a little bit about our drug. And to do that, I like to build on what Dr. Connorsman had uh, reviewed with you in the last session about the cost of DM1. Um, so DM1 is caused by a mutation in the gene DMPK, which lead to a uh, production of a toxic form of the DMPK mRNA. And this is um, the um, nucleotide repeat that you heard about, the hairpin loop that comes together. And that ha hairpin loop can end up interacting with other proteins, which are very important in general function for RNA processing, kind of global processes. So this toxic RNA, um, because of that, the toxic RNA um, really affect many, many aspects of a cellular function. And also this, is not only in specific cell type, but in many cells throughout the body, which I know you guys know very, very well. And specifically, it interacts, um, it causes a lot of issues in muscle cells, um, including the heart muscle, smooth muscle, and uh, respiratory muscle, and also muscle for mobility. And as a result, um, the symptoms, some of the symptoms are listed here. And um, this is very important because we have designed a drug that specifically um, interact with the DMPK toxic RNA in the muscle cells. So we hope by decreasing the toxic RNA, we're able to improve some of the symptoms listed here. So what is AOC1001? Um, this is a cartoon of our drug. Um, its AOC stands for antibody oligonucleotide conjugate, and it's really being developed to target the root cause of DM1. And to go into a little bit more detail, uh, um, AOC is made up of two major components um, in, in its structure. One of them is an antibody. The other one is oligonucleotide or an oligo. Antibody is a naturally occurring protein made by our body to help fight infection. And it's also commonly used in drug development because they can bind to protein very specifically. So it can influence a protein that's involved in a disease process. Um, oligonucleotide or oligo is a short strand of DNA or RNA. It, can, it has been demonstrated to be a very powerful therapeutic agent because it can influence um, gene expression as well as protein level. So again, modifying a disease process. 
Um, so to tell you a little bit more about our oligonucleotide, it's called um, siRNA for small interfering RNA. And siRNA is involved in a process called RNA interference which is a natural biologic process that regulates gene expression by interfering with the messenger RNA, um, such as the messenger RNA of the DMPK gene. RNA therapeutics has been used um, to target disease-causing RNA um, in several diseases, in addition to DM1. So, um, so this is something that I think um, you know, you'll hear more about. So to put it all together, so what happens is that A0, AOC101 um, is being infused into the body and it circulates in the, in the body and binds to a specific protein on the cell surface called transferrin receptor or TFR1. This interaction leads to the, um, the drug being pulled into the inside of the cells and the um, oligo is released and goes into the nuclei of the cells where it can find the toxic RNA of DMPK. And once they interact together, this leads to the toxic RNA to be destroyed in the body. I'd like to show you two slides of data that um, that we have generated to help us understand how AOC1001 work. So this is a study done in monkeys. In this study, a, um, mon monkeys are given one single dose of AOC1001. After that, um, thigh muscle and calf muscles are biopsied basically monthly for the next three months. As you can see, um, the, the y-axis, the vertical axis, is the um, DMPK mRNA, mRNA level in, the, um, in these biopsy tissues. Um, in four weeks the, after dosing, the DMPK mRNA goes down to 75 per, uh, by 75%. And this 75% reduction is um, sustained for the next um, eight weeks. So until the end of the experiment, which is three months basically, um, the reduction is sustained. The next slide shows some of the other um, tissues that we also looked at after dosing. So we can um, get tissues from many different skeletal muscle in addition to calf and thigh. We also um, look at the tissue, the diaphragm muscle as well as heart muscle. And we can see consistently AOC1001 reduce the DMPK mRNA by 75 to 80%. And um, this data also tell us that we can dose um, in clinical studies at three month interval. So based on this data and, and several other data, um, we, are, um, we have been running two trials, one called MARINA, the other one called MARINA Open Label Extension. And li I'd like to take the next uh, few slides to, to tell you a little bit more about our clinical work. This is a slide showing the clinical study design of both of these trials. On the left in green, um, shows the design of the MARINA study. This is our first study. And um, the goal of this study is um, threefold. We want to evaluate the safety and tolerability of AOC1001. We want to study how the drug is processed by the body once it goes into the body. So the pharmacokinetics of the drug. We also want to understand how the drug would affect the um, level of DMPK mRNA in the body as well. This is a uh, randomized placebo control study. So that means that some patients will get placebo and some patients will get the study, the, the active drug. And um, the, this, this treatment assignment is blinded to both patients and study site staff. MARINA trial has two parts, part A and B. Part A is a single dose um, um, cohort 
at one milligram per kilogram. And then um, the patients are monitored for six months. Part B have three cohorts with increasing um, doses. And each participant in Part B will get three doses and also be monitored for a total of six months. After six months, um, patients from the MARINA trial is invited to join the MARINA open label extension trial. And this trial lasts two, uh, for two years and it allow us to provide um, AOC1001 to all participants. It also allows us to collect long-term safety and efficacy data. So MARINA trial is a small trial. Uh, we're aiming to enroll 44 adults with DM1 who are between age of 18 and 65 years old with a genetic diagnosis of DM1 and as well as symptoms and also um, their ability to walk independently for at least 10 meters during screening. Currently, there are multiple sites um, who, that are open across the US um, for this trial. And these tri trial sites are selected for their deep um, knowledge and experience in managing and caring for patients with DM1. As I described in the beginning, um, Avidity is committed to um, partner with patients and um, family in designing our trials, and that's no exception for the MARINA trial as well. MARINA has been designed with input from the DM1 community with a goal to minimize barriers to participation and enhancing overall experience. So these are some of the things that we have implemented into the trial. This include the home health and telemedicine visits instead of in-person clinic visit. Also include travel concierge service, which will help to arrange and prepay for airfare, lodging, and ground transportation for study participation. It also um, will include reimbursement for reasonable trial-related expenses. So I'd like to provide a little bit of update with the, for the, um, the two trials. First, I, I want to say that, um, you know, we are, uh, the Avidity team is very, very lucky and, and feel very honored to be the first trial in, a, in the last few years to, um, to be in this, in this community. And we have really appreciated um, so much enthusiasm and support from patient community and um, the um, um, physicians and SAI staff in, in their uh, support in our trial design and trial execution. And I know that everyone is very excited about the trial and we, we just feel very fortunate and grateful. And um, because the trial is ongoing, we cannot um, share a lot of information with you, but we do plan to share um, as soon as we can. So, um, so we um, really appreciate your um, support. So the first study participant for the MARINA trial was dosed on October, 2021. The part A um, single dose cohort has been fully enrolled and the dosing is complete. There has been no serious adverse event in Part A, and all the adverse events in Part A were mild and moderate to moderate. The Part B multi-dose cohorts are currently ongoing. We are planning um, to complete this trial in 2023, and we also are planning to provide a preliminary update at the end of this year. We also have initiated MARINA open label extension in July of this year, so that participants who complete MARINA may elect to continue in the, um, in the trial and uh, receive the AOC1001 um, on an ongoing basis. So in conclusion, um, Avidity is committed to work with the DN1 community um, to understand the needs and um, so that we can design, we can, we can develop a drug that can truly help transform patients and people's um, lives. And we're also very excited about the um, AOC platform, which we believe has a potential 
to, uh, uh, to provide a new way for um, targeting affected tissues and, um, and get to the root cause of the disease. So we're working very hard and we will be providing information and resource as soon as um, it's available. So my last slide, I'd like to um, show you a picture of um, members of the Avidity team. And um, these are the people who are behind the scenes supporting programs like, um, like the myotonic dystrophy program I just described to you. Um, our team is, we're very thankful um, for the continuing collaboration with the myotonic dystrophy global um, community so that we could um, be able to um, um, continue to progress and provide hopefully a drug that can be helpful. So many of our team members are here today and tomorrow at this conference, and we are very excited to continue to connect with you. And we do want to thank everyone who um, was able to attend the Avidity tour yesterday. So uh, we look forward to meet more of you. And we also um, are very heartened to see um, many of the patients who are actually, you know, whose photos are in this deck are actually present. Um, at this meeting. So thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ash Dugar. I'm the Global Head of Medical Affairs at Dyne Therapeutics. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the MDF and the organizers of this meeting for inviting uh, me to speak here today. It's always a privilege to speak to this community. And so thank you very much for, uh, for your time and attention today. These are our forward-looking statements. You can refer to them on our website if uh, you're looking for something to read. So a little bit about Dyne. Um, uh, you know, at Dyne, we have a pretty straightforward mission and a very important one. It's to develop life-transforming therapies for people living with serious and rare genetic muscle diseases. Uh, this is really core to who we are and what we do every day. This is what motivates us. It's you, uh, you inspire us, you mo motivate us. And, and this is what the company is all about. So there are some core pillars upon which, you know, we, we are, are, are working. The first is delivering for patients. Um, and it's just amazing to be able to have this opportunity in front of, of all of you. We really have been learning from this community I myself have been now in the myotonic space for almost two years. And so I've learned a tremendous amount from the community and from the advocacy leaders. And you've been sharing your journey and, and really helping us understand what this disease is really all about. So thank you. And then importantly, as we develop our clinical programs, our clinical trials, we are making sure that we're asking for your input. We do this through advisory boards, with families, with patients, and in many other ways. Um, and to make sure that as we think about these clinical trials, that we have your input so that we can make sure that we have the most patient-centric trials as well as scientifically meaningful trials. We've also built a great deal of expertise at Dyne, which is, uh, which is quite important. And we're guided by a world-class scientific advisory board with luminaries such as Dr. Charles Thornton. And importantly, we're developing a, a candidate for uh, DM1 called Dyne 101. And uh, it's really uh, important that we are able to communicate what the scientific platform is upon which Dyne 101 was developed. And we'll get into that in a bit. But I will say it's designed to overcome one big challenge, which is to be able to deliver antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs that really target the genetic basis of, di of the diseases. Uh, like DM1. Um, and so we'll talk more about that, but we really need to overcome this challenge to getting to muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, including diaphragm, as well as smooth muscle. And ultimately our goal, everyone's goal is to stop or even reverse disease progression. So thanks to Dr. Connersman and the last two esteemed uh, speakers. Um, you've heard a lot about this um, and, you know, frankly, you know, you're, you're able to teach us uh, about the disease. Um, we understand 
that symptoms appear from birth to you know older ages and ultimately the quality of life that decreases over time is substantial and so hopefully as a community we can uh, do something about this uh, a little bit about um, first a little biology 101 how proteins are made and then i'll talk about uh, about uh, dm1 and i'm going to go through these slides quickly because you've actually heard a lot about this already and of course you are quite uh, you know quite knowledgeable about this space but as you know, cells are the building blocks of our bodies and responsible for nearly all of our functions. And DNA is a part of uh, what exists in the cell nucleus that contain the instructions for making proteins. And so a section of the DNA or a particular protein is called a gene. And those are the instructions for that protein. And then DNA information about the genes is written into RNA. And so this is a process called transcription. And importantly, it goes, the RNA, after they go through the transcription process, undergo something called splicing into mRNA or messenger RNA. And this is really important. You'll hear more about splicing uh, from me and, and I'm sure other speakers, because DM1 is a spliceopathy. And so this splicing component, this function is quite important. The mRNA is then translated into protein. And, uh, and so that's just a little bit of, of some basic biology. Well, the DM1, DM1 is caused by very high numbers of abnormal repeats in a DNA section of the DMPK gene. Again, you've heard a, a ton about this. Um, as you know, people with DM1 have abnormally high uh, number of repeats of CTG uh, in the blood and in the muscle tissue. So these repeats are then copied to make RNA. And these abnormally long CTG repeats um, sort of make this toxic mRNA in the nucleus that trap proteins like muscle blind protein. They're sequestered in the nucleus and they can't do what they're normally supposed to do, which is related to splicing. And so then these trap proteins form clumps and they, can, as I said, they can't leave the nucleus. And ultimately this leads to abnormal splicing. And abnormal splicing is believed to be the cause of many of the symptoms of myotonic dystrophy type one. As you know, there's no approved DM1 treatments that target the DMPK gene. There's no disease modifying treatments out there yet. So current therapies focus on minimizing the symptoms. There have been prior attempts and they've been hampered by the ability to get into muscle cells. And so there's really a need for disease modifying DM1 treatments that can get into the nucleus of the muscle cells to target the genetic basis of the disease reduce the toxic DMPK mRNA that resides in the nucleus, and then restore uh, splicing so that ultimately function can be improved. And so we've developed a very targeted delivery approach uh, to be able to deliver therapeutics that hopefully will make a transformative difference in the lives of patients. So I'll spend a, a minute on the FORCE platform. This, so this is the scientific platform upon which all our therapeutics for various muscle disorders are based. Um, here on the left-hand side, you can see three components to the FORCE platform. The first is an antigen binding fragment or an antibody fragment or a FAB. Now, this FAB is linked using a linker to an antisense oligonucleotide. And again, this ASO is what targets the genetic basis of DM1, and it binds to toxic nuclear DMPK RNA. So as we develop DYNE 101, I'm just gonna go through a schematic of how, it, how it's designed to work. So this FAB, this antigen binding fragment, which is a portion of a larger monoclonal antibody that you heard about in the last talk, attaches to something called the TFR1 receptor. Again, you heard about it before, the transferrin receptor 1. And the nice thing about this receptor is that it's ubiquitous. It's highly expressed across cells, skeletal, cell, skeletal muscle cells, smooth muscle, and cardiac. So we're actually able to um, use our, you know, the, the, the body's own natural cell biology to be able to use this receptor-mediated approach to pull the ASO into the cell. So as you can see here, the uh, DYNE 101 attaches to the TFR1 receptor, and then the antisense oligo is released and binds to the toxic uh, mRNA. And thereby it's able to release those trapped proteins so that they, they can resume their normal function in terms of splicing and other function. 
So before the clinical trial, as you know, there's a number of uh, preclinical studies, animal studies, and studies in patient cells that companies very often do. And so at Dyne, we have really not shied away from trying to understand our, uh, ther our potential therapeutic, and we've, we've tried to explore it in every model possible. So we wanted to understand a few things, how it gets into the muscles, where it gets into, uh, and, and how effectively it gets into the muscle. And then is it doing what it needs to do? Is it reducing the toxic DMPK RNA in the nucleus? And is it correcting splicing? And then are we actually going to see some resulting uh, effects in terms of function? So we've done a number of studies in patient cells, uh, as well as uh, mouse, uh, mice models and in monkeys. And I'll just get into a little bit of that data uh, in a moment here. I do want to point out the HTFR1 DMS Excel mouse model is particularly interesting. So this model actually expresses the human transferrin receptor, and it expresses the human toxic DMPK RNA. So we're actually able to test our clinical candidate, Dyne 101, in this HTFR uh, DMS Excel mouse model. So this is uh, one piece of a, of a large data set just to illustrate the power of the force platform and what Dyne 101 can do. So in this particular study, there were uh, animals were dosed with two relatively low doses, uh, 10 mg per kg of Dyne 101. And we wanted to see if we could do what we think it should be doing. And as you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide in the histogram, we're able to see a nearly 50% reduction in the toxic human DMPK RNA. And then is it actually releasing those trapped proteins? And here you can see on the, in the middle part of the slide on the left-hand panel, it says PBS. That's essentially saline, uh, phosphate, phosphate buffered saline. And you can see the red dots, you can see those foci or those trapped protein. And then following treatment, you can see on the right-hand side, uh, nearly 50% reduction in that foci. And so we are able to have that uh, reduction in terms of the, the foci. And then did, did this lead to splicing correction? So in this particular mouse model, a homozygous model of the HTFR DMS XL mouse, you can see that splicing correction uh, or splicing is corrected to a, a large extent. Um, so we're able to show that that sequence of DMPK knockdown, foci reduction, and splicing correction is happening with Dyne 101. So this slide just uh, summarizes some uh, other data that we have generated. And just in the interest of time, maybe I'll just jump down to the bottom half of the slide. Importantly, we also did studies in non-human primates or monkeys. We needed to make sure that we're able to get into those uh, larger species, get in the tissues of larger species. And we have shown that we can get into the skeletal muscle, the diaphragm, cardiac, and smooth muscle, and even the, the masseter, the, the jaw. In terms of the safety, the toxicology, we saw that overall, in this 13-week toxicology study that Dyne 101 had a favorable safety profile. So all of this gives us great confidence as we move into the clinic that we're, you know, we've done the right work, um, we've been able to demonstrate the mechanisms of action, it's doing what it should be doing, and, um, and it's safe in the, in the monkeys. So we're moving into the clinic now. So a little bit about the uh, approach to getting into the clinic. So first of all, we recognize the expertise that sits in this room and, and other places uh, in the DM community. And so we have been sure to tap into global multidisciplinary scientific input uh, to be able to inform our clinical development plan and our clinical trial that I'll show you in just a moment. And so we've gotten input into that study design as well as the endpoints that we should be looking at in this first in human trial that, that I will show. And also, what are the key safety considerations that we should be keeping in mind? And then also, there's a lot of natural history data out there. And it's important for us to be able to learn from the community and from the scientists, from the physicians, uh, what that natural history is to be able to properly contextualize uh, the data we're going to generate from our clinical trials. Importantly, we've also been uh, fortunate enough to get input from global advocacy leaders, from patients themselves, from family members to help us think through what, what should we be considering 
from a patient perspective in terms of our trial design. And so we've asked about considerations for trials. What will make you choose to participate in a trial or not? And then understanding all of these trials have significant burden. What can we do to minimize patient burden during the trial? Patient support services, travel support, reimbursement services, or even the order of assessments when a patient walks in the door for that clinical trial. And then what kind of other support and education can we provide to the sites to provide those families or to participants directly? And so we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of advice that's shaped our programs and our thinking. So very briefly, uh, DYNE 101, or the ACHIEVE clinical trial, is a randomized placebo-controlled phase one, two study. There are four, uh, uh, four sections to this study, if you will. One is a screening period up to six weeks. And the, the uh, next part is a uh, multiple ascending dose period, which, in which participants receive either DYNE 101 or placebo for 24 weeks. And we're looking at different dose regimens to be able to um, find a way to minimize the patient burden in terms of uh, dose uh, as much as possible. And then an open label treatment period where all patients receive DYNE 101 for 24 weeks and then a long-term extension of 96 weeks. The endpoints, as, as you would imagine for a first in human study, is safety and tolerability. It's extremely important. We understand the safety profile of DYNE 101 as we enter the clinic. We also want to understand the pharmacokinetics. So, you know, what it, you know, how is it acting in the blood and in tissue? And then what are the biochemical and physiologic effects of DYNE 101 as well? And of course, measures of strength and function. And we have been very thoughtful about the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this first in human study will enroll about 64 participants between the ages of 18 and 50. And then here you can see the various criteria to be able to enter uh, the study with uh, one of the key ones being onset of DM1 muscle symptoms uh, starting at least at the age of 12. As I mentioned, there's a placebo period for the first 24 weeks. And we do plan to uh, generate uh, meaningful, clinically meaningful data, of course, and communicate data in the second half of next year from the uh, placebo controlled period. And then, as I said, placebo, uh, participants will receive active drug in the open label and long-term extension periods. I'm pleased to say we've activated a site uh, in New Zealand, and we're working to activate sites uh, across the globe. And so, you know, with that, um, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Um, we'll be around for questions in the booth uh, outside, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions later. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Gor Sarkisian, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity for me to introduce Green Gene Therapeutics. Uh, we are a new organization, and our primary target is DM2. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. So we are... Um, we believe we are novel in our theory, in our um, philosophy. Um, we are a disease-centric company, basically, and uh, which means we are free of certain constraints that other therapeutic or uh, other companies have. If I figure out how this thing works. Okay, so um, throughout my career, I have seen the following um, schematics, basically, in drug de developments. Uh, usually, throughout years of uh, development in academic setting of a specific disorder, we um, learn that a certain receptor, a certain protein is involved in it, okay? And from that point on, the research is aimed at the protein, the receptor. As a result of that, obviously, we find that uh, that protein, that receptor is involved in a number of cellular pathways and uh, cellular functions. And as a result, it can be 
exploited as a therapeutic means for a number of different diseases. And then uh, after that, of course, we try to find small molecules that interact with that particular re receptor as a means of a therapeutic agent. And one of them later is picked as a therapeutic agent, but for one reason or another, that becomes a therapeutic agent for disease or disorder N. And why is that? Uh, for several reasons. Uh, one would be, you know, a pool of molecules that have been screened. Some of them are not biologically available. Some of them are toxic. And that particular receptor the molecule that was investigated turns out to be or show efficacy in another disorder, not the one that uh, the research has begun with. Or alternative really development of a, a therapeutic agent for disorder number one is simply too expensive. It will take too long of a time. Now, our approach is somewhat different. Uh, we try to combine the total knowledge and ex expertise experience that many different fields uh, of science currently possess, which include cell therapy, gene therapy, small, large molecules, AI pharmacology, which is an emerging um, technology nowadays, and also uh, partnering with uh, industry leaders who have um, vast experience in the uh, fields of this uh, type of disorders that would be beneficial and then expedite the, uh, us reaching our final goal. Now, as, uh, as you know that uh, currently we have some models for DM2, but uh, we don't have very robust in vitro models, in vivo models. Uh, there are some works being done towards mouse models, which is very exciting. Um, but uh, we are still at uh, somewhat of an infancy of developing uh, therapies for DM2. Now, our approach is a combination of gene and cell therapy, okay? Um, it's straightforward, easy, well, not really. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, our approach is harvesting fibroblasts from the patients, transforming, transforming them into pluripotent stem cells, performing gene editing on those cells. And that's a very lengthy and multi-step process also. Then once uh, the population of cells that meet our criteria is cherry-picked, those cells are then uh, transformed into um, myocyte progenitor cells and then are used as a means to repopulate the mutated cells that cannot sustain uh, healthy uh, muscle. Now, again, um, just briefly, fibroblasts from the dermis are harvested, they're grown, in vitro, um, then they are uh, we we generate uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells from these uh, this patient derived fibroblasts, and then through a series of gene editing um, processes, um, we generate a pool of uh, iPSCs. But the next step is we basically generate single cell uh, clones of these iPSCs to pick the ones that have specific editing that we are aiming at, the ones that have um, no off-target editing and are basically solid and viable cell treatment um, cells. Then after that, we transform them into myocyte progenitor cells, okay? Cells that are able to repopulate the muscle with healthy cells. 
so as in order to achieve our goal, we are um, partnering or partnered already with uh, clinicians in the field of DM, um, experts in a stem cell therapy industry, um, experts in the green in um, uh, gene editing, and um, altogether, our goal is to develop a personalized treatment for a specific patient because it's tissue harvested from the patient for the patient. Uh, this takes care of some problems such as graft versus host um, as versus to versus um, off the shelf cell therapy. And we have a sustained or, or already uh, available upon demand pluripotent stem cells if needed down the road. Um, having said this, uh, we are proud to be strategically also uh, find ourselves in a place in which we are able to support any other research that is being done towards um, finding uh, solutions for DM2. So we are ready to partner with anybody who's, uh, who has, is working towards DM2 and uh, our research is available. And our goal is to find treatment cure. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good day to everyone joining online. My name is Mike Snape. Uh, I'm from AMO Pharma. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking MDF for inviting us uh, here today to speak, and thank you to the audience for. Uh, taking the time and giving us the opportunity to talk to you. So let me see if I can make this work. Right, uh, we are a small company, half based in the UK, half based in the US. Uh, we were formed by a group of people who are interested in helping children who perforce of genetic disorders have problems with their development. So we're focused on congenital myotonic dystrophy. Uh, I'm, like the other speakers, not going to do a great long spiel about all of the symptoms of congenital myotonic dystrophy because you know what they are. I just want to highlight one thing because I think it'll come into this talk later on, uh, which is focused on explaining where we are in terms of clinical our clinical work um, with a compound called AMO02. Congenital myotonic dystrophy, like adult onset myotonic dystrophy, is a very disparate disorder. It affects multiple organ systems somewhat variably. And so you're presented with a kind of cluster or syndrome of things that you have to deal with. And that presents some interesting challenges for clinical trial development. So just try and hold in the back of your mind, I think, a distinction that we've been using internally between chronic symptoms in congenital myotonic dystrophy, movement issues, cognitive issues, the presence of autism, things that are there every day on an ongoing basis that are kind of common to a high number of individuals who are affected. And we can measure them because they're there all the time. Whereas there are other symptoms that are incredibly important and concerning for the individuals and their families that are more episodic, maybe cardiac events that occur infrequently, that we can't necessarily do clinical trials on in this population because they occur infrequently and unpredictably. So that makes it hard to measure in a rare disease with a rare, a small number of patients. So we're focused on uh, the kids and adults with congenital onset DM1. This has no approved treatment. We're interested in, uh, people have used already the term, disease modifying agents. So things that address the underlying biology rather than just treating symptoms. And as you've had great explanations from the preceding speakers, this is a disorder of RNA. So we want to try and target that abnormal RNA. So what is the investigational medicine we're working on? Uh, we call it AMO02. It was a medicine developed by another company who were interested in other brain-mediated disorders. Um, we've taken over the compound from them. It's a traditional low molecular weight pharmaceutical. 
what does that mean? Why is that relevant? It's a powder that you can make into a strawberry flavored liquid by mixing it with water. And then you can take it by mouth or through a feeding tube uh, if you need to use one of those. You take it once a day, it's absorbed through the, uh, the digestive system, it gets into the bloodstream, and from the bloodstream, it gets into cells in every organ of the body, we know that. So we know that this drug can get to the brain, it can get to muscle, it can get to your GI tract, it can get to your liver, it can get everywhere. And once it's within a cell, I, I'm, I'm gonna speak kind of briefly today, I'm very happy if anyone wants to get into more detail, uh, outside of uh, these presentations. But once the material is within the cell, it will then disrupt and fragment the CUG, repeat RNA, that is causal for congenital myotonic dystrophy uh, and adult onset myotonic dystrophy. And you can see that on the slides on the screen at the moment. Uh, in, this is work done in Luba Timchenko's lab at Children at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. This red fluorescent staining that she's shown, her group has shown in tissue from children with the disorder or from uh, experimental mouse models. That fluorescent red is staining of the mutant RNA that causes the disorder. And in the presence of our compound, it goes away. So our hypothesis is kind of can be explained or posited rather simply. You take the drug by mouth, it gets to all the tissues in your body and it removes the underlying cause of the disorder. So hypothetically, therefore, it should be able potentially to reverse all of the symptoms of the condition, be they brain mediated, muscle mediated, GI tract, whatever. To test that idea, we've done an initial clinical trial. This is a small study uh, done in adolescents and adults with primarily congenital, but also childhood onset DM1. This is a published study. I've presented it before as of other members of the team. So I'm not gonna go into massive detail. The key thing is during short-term treatment. So from about six weeks on using lots of different ways of measuring benefit, either conducted by the physician in the room or by the caregivers or where possible the patients themselves, looking at multiple different things assessed separately and independently by multiple different categories of people. We have a rapid onset reversal of some of the symptoms across the body in individuals with congenital onset myotonic dystrophy. And that's in the presence of an acceptable safety profile. So this is a small study, an initial preliminary pilot study uh, done in the first instance that was encouraging. Uh, but there's a saying in science, nothing is true until you've done it twice and got the same data twice. So because of that, we have embarked on another set of clinical studies. So we are presently running a pivotal or phase three study in children with congenital myotonic dystrophy. Uh, we call the study REACH CDM. It is a standard study, very much as people have described in the preceding uh, presentations. It's what's called a double blind placebo controlled study, where half of the children in the study get placebo and half of them get this compound AMO02. They are treated for 22 weeks. And this is done in what's called a blinded fashion. So we, the company, don't know who's getting placebo and don't know who's getting the active drug. Neither do the patients, neither do their caregivers, and neither do the doctors. There's a computer somewhere that knows, and somehow at the end of the study, it tells us who got what. So this study is currently ongoing for boys and girls, six to 16, who have a confirmed diagnosis of congenital myotonic dystrophy. It's running across the world, as you can see, um, in a number of sites in North America and uh, Australia and Canada. It is almost complete in terms of enrollment. Uh, I think we have slots for two more people. Uh, once they are enrolled, that's it. We're done closing the study. And if you do the maths, if we were in enroll those two patients shortly, 22 weeks of treatment, we will have a result in the first part of next year. Patients who uh, participate in that study are eligible, if they would like to, to then roll out of that study when they're finished into what's called an open label extension study. 
Open label means there's no placebo. Everyone gets the drug. They get the drug for a year at the moment, and I'll come back to that. And that's important. We're doing that study for two reasons. Number one, to gather a year's worth of safety data above and beyond the first study. And secondly, obviously, people who are involved in the first stage may be on placebo, so this guarantees them the opportunity to get access to the medicine if they would like to do that. Those are the studies that we're running. Uh, I would like to talk, if I may, just a little bit about what we're measuring, because I think that's really important and it's come up in questions to us, uh, the team, on a number of occasions. So firstly, we're obviously measuring safety, that's of paramount importance, but then as well as measuring safety, we're measuring whether or not the drug is conferring any benefits. And that's an interesting challenge in a condition where any organ and system of the body can be involved. So you can have symptoms relating to any organ system. How do you capture all of that, particularly when not every patient will have every symptom? So there's variability going on. So what we've tried to do is leverage work um, by Professor Chad Heatwell and Professor Nick Johnson, who is here in developing an outcome uh, assessment approach. And what we've ended up with after working with them and for a couple of years with the FDA is something called the CDM1RS, which is an imaginative title for the congenital DM1 rating scale. And hopefully this little graphic helps you here. What this does is looks at 11 areas from brain related symptoms like cognitive difficulties, difficulties thinking, through communication and autistic symptoms across the whole of the body. And for each of those 11 areas creates a score that goes from zero to four, where zero is there's just no symptoms and where four is the symptoms are as severe as they could possibly be. And those 11 scores are then added up to get a total score. And that gives you a number that represents the severity of the symptoms for that individual. And long story short, what we have shown in the preliminary validation studies is that if we look at those individual areas and the scores on them, if we then go to secondary outcome measures, so additional measurements we can make and look at, for example, cognitive performance on an iPad, something like that, that correlates with the score for difficulty in thinking on the primary outcome measure. So this primary outcome measure can kind of do all of the tasks that all of the specific secondary outcome measures can do, but we include them as well. Uh, so that's what we're measuring. Uh, just a tiny bit of preliminary data to make one point about that. This is some validation data taken at a baseline level when in individuals who've received no drug. And you can see those 11 items and their scores from naught to four, the average score. I guess the point I want to make is that you can see uh, this group of children with congenital myotonic dystrophy, they're impacted across the board. It's, it's not just like they have one thing, a, a movement problem or a sleepiness problem. Many different things are involved in these individuals, but we can capture that in this relatively simple uh, rating scale approach. So where are we? The REACH CDM study, the first part, the double blind placebo controlled part was due to start in April of 2020, but guess what? There was a pandemic. So we had to wait nigh on a year before we could start. We then started in March, April, 2021. And it was an interesting challenge. I, I'd like, if I can, to give some credit to our clinical team and our partner organization, Styrus, who helped us operationalize the trial, and to all of the staff at the sites. The new normal is a completely new normal for running clinical trials. It's been one little thing after another, just like in the rest of life, where nothing seems to be the way it was before the pandemic. Nothing is the way it was. Uh, in terms of running clinical trials. So the trial has been a labor of love and I really, really want to thank the sites for doing that. And obviously the families where, you know, we see affected caregivers bringing affected children into the burden and the difficulty of doing a clinical trial. 
in the conditions of a pandemic. It, it's a tremendous ask and really difficult thing to do. Uh, and I'm just so grateful to everyone involved that they've persisted and been able to do that. It, it's been a, a, a real inspirational experience to watch that unfold. In terms of the REACH CDM study, it's blinded. So obviously we don't know what's going on with efficacy, but from a safety perspective, we have a data safety monitoring committee that's independent of us that meets every quarter. So I think they've had five meetings so far. The safety profile of the uh, medication is exactly as predicted with no nasty surprises. So that's a reassurance. That's where we are with that study. With regard to the extension study, which is open label, again, there've been no surprises in terms of safety events. And I think it's fair and reasonable to say that the majority of families, I think all but one family moved from the double blind phase to the extension phase. And there has been lots of multiple inputs saying that the extension phase is a positive experience. And in fact, we're now getting, as people are coming to the end of that, a lot of inquiries with regard to, well, what happens when that study has finished? And I think there's a couple of points to make there. We are amending our, our paperwork and our arrangements with the regulatory authorities and the ethics review committees so that as patients finish that study, they can carry on and get access to the drug. We're working as fast as we can uh, to do that, to, to meet that demand for people who, who want to continue for whatever reason, their participation of access to the drug. We are then beginning the process of preparing something we call an NDA or new drug application. Uh, that is a whole lot of work that ends up in gigabytes of data that will be submitted to the FDA and regulatory authorities, such that if we get a positive result in the study in the early part of next year, then we can submit uh, and ask the regulators to approve this uh, as a, um, a prescription medication. That doesn't mean that we've forgotten about other people, people who didn't meet the criteria for enrollment for these studies and the adult uh, onset population. I don't think I can get into detail now, but I will say we are making further plans uh, along those lines. So that is kind of where we are. I hope that's uh, helpful and clear. If it wasn't, uh, you can go to our websites to log on to get automatic updates. We are here, we have a booth outside. Love to meet people, very happy to answer any questions. So if you have any comments, criticisms or queries, please do feel free to approach us. Thank you very much.